very much for having me here. It's really a pleasure to be here. This place is quite uh, remarkable. I've never been here before, so uh, the uh, whole building is really very remarkable. My name is Dan Brownsnake. I'm uh, one of the orthopedic surgeons at RA3B, like Linda was saying, and I specialize in shoulder and elbow surgery. So my talk today is going to be about shoulder pain and more specifically about rotator cuff tears, uh, which is a very common cause of shoulder pain. Um, so, I figured we start with a, a case example of this uh, patient, um, and this is a patient at the Newtown Athletic Club, it's a woman named Donna, she was lifting weights, just right across the way in her gym, and she developed right shoulder pain. And I asked Linda to send me a picture of uh, you know, a typical person that comes to the Newtown Athletic Club, she was shocked, I didn't know you guys got to start <laughs> here, um, you know, I, I have never seen anyone work out this job, but you guys must be very into fitness here. Uh, but this is more of a, 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 a real example of what someone like Donna would look like and, and lifting weights uh, and you know, you know, try to stay fit. And so Donna, she works as a lawyer, she enjoys tennis and swimming, and she lives with her husband. Uh, she has two kids who no longer reside with her, they're out of the house, and she doesn't smoke and she's socially on the weekend. So she's sort of a normal uh, working woman that also likes to work out. Um, so she was lifting weights at the Newtown Athletic Club and felt some gain which is a common uh, you know, thing that I see in my office, uh, that someone had a, work, a workout actually, and then, and then basically they get home, they're in a little bit of pain, uh, they were able to finish their workout, um, but uh, then they go on the ice, they take out of it. Then the next morning, they wake up and they're in terrible pain, can't lift their arm above their head, and that's what happened to Donna. She wishes she was taking advantage of the beautiful pool there instead of uh, uh, working out uh, the day she had the injury. So let's talk a little bit about shoulder pain. Um, shoulder pain is the third most common cause of uh, people presenting to their doctors for musculoskeletal complaints behind knees and lower backs. Um, it's reported in about 35% of uh, people, 25 to 74. So it's a very common uh, uh, issue that people have uh, hurting their shoulders. Um, if you look at a graph, this is a graph of uh, shoulder pain visits to the hospital uh, in 2010. Um, and there are about 11 million total visits in America. And then they break it down by age, and the purple line, which is the most uh, prevalent line, is people between 45 to 64. So those are the most common people that are gonna uh, have shoulder pain. It's less common in younger people. Um, and then the next, uh, the next, or children, the next people are about 18 to 44, and then 65 to 84. It's less common in teenagers, and it's less common in the really older uh, elderly, because they can, even if they have an issue, they can usually sort of just live with it because they're lower demand and they're not really using it as much. But the most common uh, people that have it are, are 45 and 64. So that's the most common people that will show up in my office. Uh, so causes of shoulder pain. I mean, it's kind of like a big black box. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of causes of shoulder pain. And it's really up to people like me to try and figure out what's going on. And so in medicine, we use the term differential diagnosis. So when someone comes in from shoulder pain, we're trying to figure it out. We think of all the options that it could possibly, and we try to narrow it down. And you can see from this list, there's a there's a bunch of things that could cause shoulder pain. And I just listed them here, I'm not going to go through them all. Um, but there's a lot of reasons why people can have shoulder pain. But I kind of uh, so so there's a lot of reasons why you're shoulder pain. So there's a famous quote in medicine. Uh, by a famous physician that says, when you hear hope beats, think of horses, not zebras. And that sort of means that uh, we try and think of the most common reasons why someone would have shoulder pain, and that's what we go to first. Uh, we don't try, like, we try and whittle it down, we don't really go to the obscure reasons for, for why someone would have some issue uh, right after that. So I sort of narrowed down the top five reasons why people would come into the diet with shoulder pain. By common, the most, the most common, uh, uh, way people come to see me is someone that has rotator cuff disease, whether that's a string in the rotator cuff, a partial tear, or a full tear of the rotator cuff, and we get into that a little bit. A muscle strain is another common reason, although normally those will sort of uh, get better in a shorter period of time and I'm less likely to see those because by, you know, usually about six weeks people are better. Shoulder arthritis is another reason, um, and um, that is the loss of cartilage in the joint. I'm not going to go into that that much during this talk, but it's a it's a, it's a problem that afflicts many people, and, uh, similar to knee and hip arthritis, which is more common. Uh, frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis is another thing that maybe you've heard of, and that's when people get stiffness in their shoulder, they can't move it, and it causes a lot of pain. And then AC joint arthritis is probably uh, the, the next uh, uh, most common reason for someone will come to me, and that is uh, arthritis from a joint that's slightly above the shoulder that can be uh, quite a nuisance. By far the most common is rotator cuff disease. Um, so, 
Um, and like I talked about, so it's the most common in active individuals. It can vary from a strain, which means nothing's actually abnormal in it. It just sort of was, uh, you know, stretched a little bit or injured a little bit. That usually is better with kind of a partial tear or a full tear. So I want to talk a little bit about the shoulder surface anatomy. Um, so the rotator cuff itself is actually pretty deep within the shoulder. You can't actually really see the rotator cuff when you're looking at someone. It's, it's not something that you can sort of look at. And if you had a tear, you can see bleeding or anything like that. Because there's larger muscles that actually cover the rotator cuff. And I'm just going to talk about that. So the, petar, the pectoralis major um, is the muscle that's kind of in the front of your chest and it goes into the, the shoulder like that. And you can see in Arnold right here, he's got three really big pectoralis major muscles and it's in the blue right there. So that's sort of the muscle in the front of the shoulder. The muscle on the side of your shoulder is not the rotator cuff either. You can see it's the deltoid muscle. Um, and uh, that's uh, in orange right there. And you can see uh, uh, this gentleman over here is a bodybuilder. It's a very, really big deltoid. You can see it very fine. And that helps elevate your arm up uh, in many points. It's a very powerful uh, elevator of the arm. And then in the back, again, it's not the rotator cuff that you see. It's the trapezius muscle. And it's uh, defined there in red. Um, and. Um, that helps sort of shrug shoulders, and you can see uh, I circled, he has a very big trapezius. So the rotator cuff is actually very deep. It's not something that can really be visualized by just looking at someone's shoulder. Um, these, three, these three muscles I point out are really more the surface than the muscles of the shoulder. So the rotator cuff, it's deep. Like I said, the muscle definitions are not really easily uh, defined by just looking at it. So this is a uh, sort of model of the rotator cuff. And, Stripping away all those other muscles, this is sort of looking very deep into the shoulder. The shoulder is a ball and socket joint. Um, and so the ball is sort of right here, uh, and the socket is there. And the rotator cuff goes from the shoulder, the socket side to the ball side, and it sort of helps keep the muscle stable when you're moving it, uh, and it helps in certain areas, uh, certain types of motion. Um, and there's four of them. There's one in the front, there's one on the top, and there's two in the back. The, most, the one that's commonly torn is the one on the top, or the, the most uh, common one where people, where it bothers people is the one on the top. Um, so the mechanism or onset of injury could be traumatic or atraumatic. So commonly I'll see people who, who work in uh, like heavy labor jobs and they had an injury where they're lifting with 100 pounds or something and they feel terrible pain and they have an acute uh, rotator cuff tear. But that is less common. Most people have a traumatic onset of the symptoms. And so basically it's just like something that happens. People can't really pinpoint one specific thing that happened. It just sort of happened over time and it doesn't go away. That's the more common scenario for someone that has rotator cuff tear. Less common. Um, uh, like a traumatic, like just like one traumatic event. So does anyone know who this is? Yes. Paul, Paul Newman. Exactly. So this is Paul Newman. And you can see from left to right, this is sort of the stages of Paul Newman on the left. Uh, he's a young man in the middle, he's sort of middle aged on the right, he's an old, uh, a bit older. And so rotator cuff tears are very dependent on age. So the Paul Newman on the left is not going to have a rotator cuff tear because it really doesn't affect people, you know, below their 40s. And even in their 40s, it's very, it's, it's somewhat more rare. It really doesn't start affecting people until they're middle aged. So the middle aged Paul Newman is someone that's going to complain of uh, rotator cuff tear. And the, uh, the older one on the right may have a rotator cuff tear, but he's less likely to complain about it just because he doesn't have the kind of demands that uh, a younger person would have. Um, so, um, again, just sort of talking about this again, uh, as you mature, you know, the tissues in your body, you know, just lose strength. And that's why, sort of, rotor, you uh, can study rotator cuffs, um, they're way more prevalent in people that are, you know, as you advance in age. And that's probably due to the rotator cuff degeneration with age. Um, and that's what we see. So this is another graph, uh, I'm sorry, another graph uh, of full thickness rotator cuff tears. And so uh, the blue is male and the red is female. But as you see, um, as, you, as you're in your 30s, it's very low. Um, and then as you go up to the 70s, it sort of starts to take uh, a spike up. And the people that are more symptomatic, which we're coming right out, are probably in this range, 40 to 60. So are the people that are still very active, and, and, and if someone has a rotator cuff tear, probably going to bother them. So what are the symptoms of a rotator cuff tear? Pain is probably the most common symptom, and it's, and it's the most bothersome symptom. You know, no one wants to be in pain, and that's most 
probably most of the reason why uh, people come see me in the office. Uh, you have limited motion, you have weakness, and you get a cracking or rubbing. If people commonly complain of pain, kind of where uh, this woman is complaining of pain, it's kind of out here on the shoulder, and then it goes, it radiates down like that. That's the most common complaint. Everyone's a little different. Some people have feel pain a little differently, but it's mostly here, and then it goes down. And then pain can be quite debilitating. So here, even Greek gods, they're used to throwing uh, thunderbolts could potentially have an issue if they have a rotator cuff tear. The pain can be really quite debilitating. Uh, and it makes it difficult. So again, the pain location uh, is typically where that you know, red circle is. It's kind of out here and it goes down your arm a little bit. Uh, and this is a uh, picture of Kobe Bryant. And Kobe Bryant is a well-known uh, Laker, as many of you may know. And he actually had a rotator cuff tear at a very young age. He was in his 30s. Uh, and, you know, it's, you know, obviously he's a high-level athlete, so things are totally different with high level athletes, they really put a lot of stress on their body. And you can see here it's kind of holding where where the pain is, uh, I'm sorry, where a typical pain is for someone that has a rotator cuff there. And he actually has a rotator cuff there and went back to the basketball, but he's not here, he's going to use the He's had a number of years. So another thing that people would, will typically come in and complain of is they have limited motion. So as you can see, this woman on the right, she can get this right hand all the way up, but her left hand uh, she really just can't lift up anymore. And that is, some of it has to do with weakness, because if you have a rotator cuff tear, you're a little weaker. And some of it has to do with pain. You just don't want to, you know, as you raise it up, it starts to hurt more. And that is what you're going to do. Another thing that people commonly can have is popping and cracking in the shoulder um, with a rotator cuff tear. Um, and this is sort of increased with age. Sometimes arthritis uh, gets into the picture. But it's a very common thing to have popping and cracking in the shoulder when you have rotator cuff tear. So treatment. The first thing you can do is just simple activity modification. Sometimes that works for people. Um, just sort of eliminate the activities that bother you and do what you know, doesn't bother you. And that's a totally fine treatment option. And for some people, that's very effective. The next uh, treatment plan that we like to offer is physical therapy. And physical therapy is very, very effective uh, with uh, rotator cuff uh, tearing. It sort of helps you stretch out your muscles. Um, and they have a lot of different modalities that you can do to help you get over the pain. The next treatment option that we typically have to offer for people with rotator cuff tearing are, uh, is a cortisone injection. And so that's a steroid that you inject into the shoulder and it takes away inflammation. It doesn't actually heal the tear, but it can give you sort of a temporary pain relief. And then sometimes with therapy or just with time, your pain will go away. And then the final way we treat these is surgery. And typically, uh, it's going to be an arthroscopic surgery to repair a rotator cuff. And I'll get to that. So non-operative treatment. This is really mostly the mainstay for rotator cuff tears because most people do get better with non-operative treatment. So if you just look at sort of the epidemiology or the statistics behind who gets rotator cuff tear, um, it affects at least 10% of the people uh, greater than 60 years old. And there's really a wide range. It could affect 70 to 40% of people. Um, and I'm just using a conservative number of 10%. So if it affects 10% of people, that means 31 million people will have in the US will have a rotator cuff tear um, over 60 years of age. And then the other issue that we have is that a lot of times these are asymptomatic. So if you did an MRI, which is the test that would find a rotator cuff tear, in you know, 100 people, 13 to 50% of them might have a, a, a rotator cuff tear but not even know it because lots of times it just doesn't bother people. So let's just say it's 50% have a symptomatic rotator cuff tear. We'll take the high number. So 15 million people have symptomatic rotator cuff tears in America. In 2006, it was only estimated that 270,000 people had rotator cuff tear surgeries. So that's a very few, that's a very low amount of number that actually end up requiring surgery. So we're very effective at treating these non-operatively and then and commonly people can get a lot better with non-operative intervention. And that's always what we start with and then people that fail and can't live with it may end up having, may end up having surgery. But it really, if you just look at the numbers, it's obviously you know, a lot of people don't end up needing surgery for this or wanting surgery. And so surgery, this is a picture of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone. They actually met, they didn't even know they were having sh uh, shoulder surgery at the same time in the same hospital. And you can see Arnold Schwarzenegger, he already had a surgery, he's in a sling. I'm sure, and my guess is he had, I don't know exactly because they don't release the information, but he probably had a rotator cuff there. And he's sitting there and this is probably before Sylvester Stallone uh, went into surgery. Uh, and this is kind of the age group where people are more likely to end up uh, having surgery. So the options for surgery, I'm just going to get into a little bit. Um, 
uh, open or mini open, and that's what was done originally for these, and that's sort of the what we say the gold standard for how things are done. Um, but it's not as commonly done these days. And like for instance, myself, I basically do all these arthroscopic, which is sort of a minimally invasive way to do surgery, and probably most people are doing it that way. Um, but in certain instances, an open surgery would be appropriate. So this is an example of an open surgery. And you can see you have to make a sort of big incision on the shoulder. And this is sort of a good view, actually. So the rotator cuff tendon, it's kind of like, it's really, it's called the rotator cuff. It's really like a cuff of tissue. The four tendons kind of blend like a cuff. And they sort of all look kind of fluent. And they're sort of white, it's just sort of a white tendon, which is right here. And then you can see this is like what the tear looks like. And then uh, you repair it back to them. So that's a, a picture of what sort of open surgery would look like. But nowadays, um, this is mostly done uh, with arthroscopy. And this is sort of an example of what arthroscopy is. Uh, basically, make very small incisions and you do your work through camera, through a camera and small incisions. So you're looking at a TV screen, so I'd be looking at a TV screen uh, while I'm doing the surgery because you're doing it all through very invasive uh, incisions. And so this is what it looks like when you, if anyone ever did need surgery for this. We do it in the beach chair position, so the patient is propped up like that. Kind of looks like a beach chair. That's what we call it, the beach chair. It kind of mimics what a beach chair uh, would look like on the beach. Um, and this is what a patient looks like actually in the operating room. Um, so you can see he's all draped away, and you know we clean off the, the 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 shoulder and the arm very well to try and prevent any kind of infection. And you can see the TV screens in the background, um, and that's what you, what I'd be looking at while the surgery uh, while I was doing the surgery. And so this is another sort of picture, and you can see this surgeon here uh, has the, uh, in the, this is the camera, and then he's doing some work through another incision, he's looking at it through the, the, the TV screen so he can know what to do. And this is kind of another picture to show kind of what it looks like. It's a cavern here, and then it's being able to see what's going on there. And so this is what a picture of a rotator cuff pair looks like. Um, arthroscopically and then another sort of uh, visualization picture. Um, and so again, arthroscopically, this is sort of the healthy white tendon right here. Um, and and it's got a big tear, so it should all look white. There shouldn't be like a hole right here. You're looking at the hole and you shouldn't be able to look at. And again, this is uh, the most common tendon that's affected, which is the tendon on the top. Uh, uh, like I said before, there are four rotator cuff tendons. And this is sort of a picture of uh, that sort of tear. And it kind of looks like a U, and that's the most common way they're torn. They can be torn in a number of different ways, but that's the most common way uh, they're torn. And then, so these are kind of a picture of what the tools are used. So like I said, we use these tools that go through cannulas, and you do all your work uh, by looking at the uh, screen. And this is a picture of some of those tools. Uh, and then afterward, this is sort of what the repair would look like if, you, uh, if uh, surgery was uh, something that was going to uh, happen. So basically, we put a number of stitches uh, into the rotator cuff tendon. So before, uh, in this picture, you, you saw that there was like a big U here. And now, we brought the tissue back and, it's, and we used sort of stitches, blue and white stitches, to repair the tendon. And that's just sort of schematic. Um, and the stitches, what, what they are is we use these bone anchors. So uh, what you do is you um, put these little sort of, they're kind of like screws, essentially. Um, and you screw them into the bone and they have stitches attached to them. And then you put them in the tendon and then you tie knots for you, and you basically tie knots and, and uh, other ways of securing it uh, back down to the bone. And so uh, my final option, just, I mean, my final slide is basically just to talk. So um, the choice of treatment uh, for someone that uh, has a rotator cuff tear um, is multifactorial. Um, and so that's part of the sort of the art of medicine. That's a discussion that you're going to have. You did have a rotator cuff tear with you or your doctor, and that's really for any condition you have anywhere. You know, there's an art of medicine for what what uh, is best for the patient, and it depends on their scenario. So a lot of things are the patient's activity level, the amount of pain and dysfunction that they have. If they're not in that much pain, probably surgery is not a great option because you know it doesn't bother them that much. But if they can't live with it. Then, you know, and they tried other things, and surgery does become good option. They've had previous treatments, what their expectations are, what the benefits and risks of their treatment, age, lifestyle, and size of the tear. So you can sort of run that algorithm. But when a patient comes and sees me, I sort of, you know, we'll have a discussion, and I like to know a little bit about them and 
you know, what their needs and desires are, what their current activity level is, and that's how you come about with a, a plan, you know, what's best uh, for the patient. So that's a little bit about the artifacts. So that is my talk. I want to thank you very much for having me here, and I can answer any questions that anyone has.